I'm calling this uh, Iconoclash, Modern Paradoxes of the Image. As I've tried to show in my recent work, there is not one, but at least two stories or more precisely symbolic evolutionary paths of the birth and development of modernity, one using words, uh, the others using imagery. Those who study the former have the advantage that the symbolic form they are studying is the same as the one that they use to study it. And the medium that helped to transform language in its use in the early modern period, the printing press largely had the effect of standardizing, clarifying, and even simplifying the form in which language would be employed. The concrete mechanical method of printing from movable type had a tactile sort of logic to it against which the subtle abstractions of modernity stood out in high contrast. In addition to their essential incompatibilities with the clarity of language, images were used to conceptualize and express modern thought in this era by a wide range of new media and techniques whose semantics are very different from each other, as well as from language. Even where style was relatively standardized, the tremendous expansion and expressive capacity far outweighs any disambiguation that may also have been achieved. Indeed, it was with a distinctively modern style and sensibility of mannerism that systems of thought in art, as well as in other forms of knowledge, were codified and organized into academies. And yet, it is an explicitly heterodox, multi-systemic, and paradox mandric style that was so systematized. As I, as, I, as I have argued elsewhere, such precise, controlled, and explicitly articulated ambiguity and paradox makes the mannerist use of images an ideal means to construct a conception of modernity, which is also essentially characterized by ambiguity and paradox. Such a relativistic and anti-essentialistic version of modernity is posed against the ideal of a universal single system that was prized from ancient times through the Middle Ages and up into the intellectual crisis of the Renaissance. Although there are many interesting reasons for the enduring fundamental intellectual error of identifying modernity with the Renaissance, perhaps the simplest and most obvious is that it is easier to explain that it was no birth of something new, but a rebirth of something ancient, the culmination of centuries of pre-modern thinking which soon came to crisis as grand systems failed miserably just when they seemed to be nearing completion. In short, that modernity was first born out of the ashes of such systems and the ambitions that motivated them is a story that is much more difficult to tell. No such use of images amply accommodates the semantic scope and subtlety of such multi-system thinking. The description of just how they are used to do this in clear language becomes particularly challenging. The purpose of this paper is to examine a new term which has been proposed to help us to understand certain paradox of our modern uses of images, iconoclash. So far, I have encountered the term in two sets of writings, one in which it is more or less literally applied to many similar concrete instances of closely related phenomena over the course of a lengthy historical study, the other in which it is used highly metaphorically in touching upon extreme, an extremely wide variety of what at times seems like incompatible examples. The latter, Bruno Latour's essay, What is Iconoclash, or Is There a World Beyond the Image Wars? verges on the bombastic in its claims for the broad power and relevance of the term, but it is unclear as uh, to unright contradictory when it comes to any detailed explanation of its meaning and reference. The former, Joseph Leo Kerner's study of the 16th century, uh, study of 16th century Lutheran painting the reformation of the image is detailed and concrete in explaining his many applications of the term, and yet it seems that his very clarity serves to highlight the intellectual complexity of that to which it is being applied. In other words, Latour makes the, town, the term sound deep. Kerner uses it to bring out the difficult nature of that which it describes. The problem, it seems to me, is to keep it from excessively outstretching its reach while at the same time 
not allowing it to lose grasp of its referent. Latour, whom Kerner credits with having originated the term, begins by defining iconoclash in terms, uh, in contrast to iconoclasm, another complex concept. I quote, iconoclasm is when we know what is happening in the act of breaking and what the motivations for what appears as a clear project of destruction are. Iconoclash, on the other hand, is when one does not know without further inquiry whether it is destructive or constructive, end quote. Examples that he mentions vary widely, taken from the history of art, science, and religion, and even including seemingly spurious cases, as uh, such as spurious case, seemingly spurious cases as an Italian newspaper photograph of firemen seemingly attacking a sacred religious relic with axes, but in reality using the axes to smash the protective class case that had protected it from being torn to pieces by members of the faithful seeking potent souvenirs so that it could be removed from the church which was on fire at the time. It's <laughs> like <laughs> uh, anomaly here. Though fitting Latour's definition, it seems to me that to read this picture as an act of destruction, uh, it, 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 though fitting Latour's de definition, it seems to me that to read this picture as an act of destruction is simply a droll misinterpretation and not an instance of any semantically complex use of imagery. And yet Latour makes some interesting assertions about the historical factors that have contributed a passionately ambiguous relation to images. Citing Freud's assertion that Pharaoh Akhenaten of Egypt created the first counter-religion with, and with it a radical sense of difference that created great hatred, he argues that herein lies the origin of the absolute distinction between truth and falsity, between a pure truth that exists without human assistance and one that is corrupted by human mediation. It is in this environment that one destroys to prove the validity of one's faith. Ironically, perhaps even hypocritically by its destroyers, the image is also used as the sole, though imperfect, means to access that unmediated truth. As has been said of the Byzantine quarrel, as been said over the Byzantine quarrel over images, truth is image, but there is no image of truth. Remarking about how the destroyers of image so often prove to be avid lovers of imagery, at least as elaborate as that which they destroy, Latour asserts that defacement and refacement of images are coeval, that the two have an intimate sort of connection. He notes the common phenomenon of reassembly and atonement that follows what he calls iconocrises, quote, as if the destroyer had suddenly realized that something else had been destroyed by mistake. Ultimately, the Latour seems interested in the constructed nature of knowledge. He contrasts the ancient, ancient notion of a chiropoeti, which describes the images that are, not man, that are not human made, with the virtues of what he calls adding the hand. Whereas holy icons would have lost their force the more they showed themselves to be human productions, what he calls the critical mind, sees evidence of human work as a sign of an image's purchase on reality. <clears throat> Thus, he concludes, we can define iconoclash as that what happens when there is uncertainty about the exact role of the hand at work in the production of a mediator. <clears throat> Kerner's book, which is devoted mainly to the analysis of Lucas Cranach's Reformation era Wittenberg altarpiece, begins with a comparison of that painting and a later romantic work, Caspar David Friedrich's The Cross on the Mountain. Both address the same question, <clears throat> how visually to represent a hidden god. Whereas Cronach depicts a crucifix as deliberately detached from the church building, emptied of icons and reduced to what we could call true images, in which it arises by representing it is markedly removed from the physical world yet still visibly there. Friedrich's painting, a secular landscape view of a mountaintop through the carved gilt summit crucifix, represents this vernacular artifact as a purely factual object of subjective appear, uh, experience. He concludes that, quote, where the Reformation located the sacred in a separate realm of inner faith, romanticism may do with the residual world, end quote. Both paintings are examples of post-iconoclastic icons, the Wittenberg 
altar piece was a response to Protestant image breaking that began in the very church in which it hung, the cross on the mountain, to enlightenment attacks against sacred art and religion during the Napoleonic era. Both, he says, utilized the crucifix simultaneously to arrest and to repeat the hammer blow that gave them space. Cronach's by purifying the sacred world, the sake by purifying the sacred of a world of facts, Friedrich's by discerning vestiges of the sacred within that impoverished world. Both crucifixes are simultaneously icon and iconoclasm, what he has learned to call iconoclash. Kern goes on to describe hundreds of ways that imagery and new ways of representing it were used to accommodate the doctrinal tendencies of rebellious Protestant saints and Catholic reaction against them. Most of these involved the use of the image as a sort of semi-propositional representation, which emphasized sense to the exclusion of reference and the flattening of meaning to a kind of object status in what Luther called true images. Throughout, he points to varied and subtle ways that the dialectic of creation and destruction manifested itself. In each instance, one is reminded of the ad adage, blasphemy implies belief. The true non-believer does not destroy image, he is merely indifferent to them. In this context, their complementary roles would be subject to various reversals. Visual representation of this sort, of unity and interpretation, interpenetration of opposites, is found in the many anamorphic pictures that were popular at the time to represent the controversy over images, as well as many others that were splitting Christianity. Another theme that runs through Kerner's work is the idea that Christian iconography was iconoclastic from the very beginning. Quote, pictures of a God who suffered and died, of the deity transformed into a monster through his abject fleshly, fleshly wounds. These were meant to train our eyes to see beyond the image, to cross it out without having to do something so undialectic as actually destroying it. Christ's incarnation itself was iconoclastic. The pagan idols crumbled before the infant Jesus. Christ's humble birth and humiliating death overturned the equation made concrete in classical art of the beautiful with the true and the good. His disciples martyred themselves rather than honor the emperor's portrait. His suffering mortified vision itself. To do as Protestants did and aim the hammer at the crucifix is to reiterate the gestures that made it. Images like that of the crucifix of the Wittenberg altarpiece can be said to represent multiple iconoclashes going back to their very origins. Indeed, the act of martyrdom itself is represented in story and image can be interpreted as a sort of simultaneous creation and destruction. Okay. Is made through his mortal death. Another point that Kerner makes and applies to many of his examples of iconoclast regards the iconoclast accusation of idolatry. Idolatry, he claims, is less a belief than a fiction about belief because there never were nor will there ever be idols since these are artifacts of the iconoclast's convictions, the imaginary other of all critical campaigns. It is iconoclasm itself that never goes away, but haunts us as if forever newly with its fictive foe, idolatry as an accusation, not a belief. The problem is that the iconoclast refuses to acknowledge the figure in which image-based piety is embedded, that the image is a representation and not the deity itself. The iconoclast is therefore the only one who takes the image literally, indeed who refuses to see it as an image. Bordering on a sort of negative idolatry itself, this iconoclash seems related to the textual literalism of modern fundamentalists. Perhaps the greatest paradox of, uh, paradoxes of iconoclashes are to be found in the specific actions of iconoclasts, that, that the specific actions that iconoclasts took against uh, images. One such group can be characterized by a certain need they had to demonstrate their destruction publicly. Behold, these zealots like to cry, showing their broken effigy to a crab. Can you see? It's nothing but wood. Were such images of the breaking of images meant to convince the convincers? 
Such display was often accompanied by degradation. Images were broken, burned, toppled, beheaded, and hanged. They were spat, pissed and shat on, tossed into toilets, sewers, rubble heaps, garbage dumps, pigsties and charnel houses, and lewdly handled in brothels and inns. Uh, but such gestures, Colonel Ar Kerner argues, never quite neutralized the thing. Desecrating the sacred icon exhibited it, it not as object, but as abject. They release a strange transgressive power. Perhaps the most ironic form uh, that such degradation took was when image breakers delighted in pretending images could speak and then mocking them for their silence, thus demonstrating the, uh, in language the idolaters met mistake of confusing things with persons. This degradation often involved defacement that left behind a face. Eyes, mouths, ears, hands, and faces of sacred images and statues were often attacked as if to render them impotent and the effects of such silencing left on the display. Images of Christ were often beaten and otherwise tortured, often in imitation of Christ's original tormentors. Such destroyed images were exhibited as images of images, imagery's destruction an iconoclast which echoed the iconoclastic iconography from which they descended. Such bizarre actions as having a saint's effigy decapitated by the town executioner led Kerner to conclude that the people who fervently venerated pictures became in the course of the Reformation, the very ones, last page, the very ones who fervently <laughs> smashed them, practicing a sort of volt sorcery like the voodoo. Such symbolic sadism even extended to violent brushstrokes used in the production of iconoclastic illustrations, as well as what Kerner calls iconoclastic anti-carving. Underlying all of the iconoclashes of Christian controversy in this tumultuous period was a similar phenomenon within the very means of their artistic expression. Out of the anonymity of the medieval period arose the idea of the artist as the source of unique genius, as superior <coughs> craftsmanship in art acquired a new cultural value. Kerner points to Albrecht Dürer's self-portrait of 1500 as fashioned in his own likeness after the miraculous Akira Poetos of Christ in order to announce that art is the perfect image of the maker. Manner's <coughs> style served to highlight not only the contributions of individual artists, but the role of the hand generally. Indeed, it is the origin of expressionism in modern art and its embrace of subjectivity. How ironic that Manner's paintings like Lucas Cronach's under pressures of iconoclasm, sought to, sought to soft petal artistry and reduce semantic depth, leading to a decline in German painting during this period. Elsewhere, I've discussed how the cult of the artist as individual genius came into conflict with his being conscripted to construct the new but reactionary world of court society, leading to alienation, madness, and what the Italian art historian Achille Benito Oliva has called the ideology of the traitor. Here I will end with the image of Cranach's most famous work, the mildly pornographic paintings and prints of female nudes done in the same underpinned painted style as the religious icons. Here the paradox of the works and the author's fame, owing to the singularly skillful anonymity of the style, runs parallel to the allure of natural women, custom made to the demands of Lutheran dogma. Is it no wonder uh, it, it, is it no wonder that this is as well the era of the birth of ideas?